Welcome to Ira's Everything Bagel, where I talk with intriguing people about everything, their passions, pursuits, and points of view. This is the era of smart technology. There has always been concern about technology replacing workers in our economy, but the accelerated development of smart technology brings that concern to the forefront today. How do workers cope against the computer, its mobile equivalent, the, the robot, and the ever-increasing sophistication of software? My guest today may have some of the answers. He's Edward D. Hess, Professor Emeritus of Business Administration, Darden School of Business, and he's the author of Own Your Work Journey, The Path to Meaningful Work and Happiness in the Age of Smart Technology and Radical Change. It's available on Amazon and all the usual places. For everything about Ed, go to ownyourworkjourney.com and you can follow him on LinkedIn, YouTube, and X. And Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very, very nice to be with you. Thank you. Well, question for you. Are most workers concerned about meaningful work? Are they really just more concerned and focused on survival given where the economy is today? Well, I think the answer is yet to your question is yes, people are concerned about where the economy is. I think it's people are concerned about automation. All right. Um, and so, and people are concerned about, okay, what do I do? How am I going to, you know, how am I going to earn a living? Uh, uh, how am I going to take care of my family, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so, Yes, there's there's high stress out in the marketplace, and it's not just, if you will, we'll call the, um, the, the the working people. It's also people that you know have MBA degrees and everything, because te technology is going to transform how work is completely done, and many things which people have learned in college, okay, won't be relevant. And so this is not just going to pick a certain segment of the community uh, and, you know, throw them out of work. Uh, every person is going to have to learn how to become a highly adaptive learner that, and that you can learn at the pace of technological change. And so it's a huge issue uh, for our country, uh, for our people, uh, and for, I mean, every person is going to feel some impact. It will be just different amounts of impact depending upon what your job is. Because yes, there are jobs that are highly likely. I mean, the best research that's been done on this is comes from Oxford University. And by 2030, 25 to 47 percent of the jobs in the United States will be automated. Well, that's a heck of a problem because we don't have a social safety net. All right. Uh, our our uh, way of capitalism is survival of the fittest and uh, and so this is a this is a national issue a personal issue a family issue that needs to basically be understood and people can start beginning to okay what type of tools do i need what type of skills do i need can i learn new skills to do a different job which technology can't do that fast. And, and there basically it comes down to three different types of jobs that are gonna be hard for technology in the next four or five years. And that's being able to think in ways that technology can't think, all right? Uh, critical thinking, innovative thinking, going into the unknown, figuring things out, making decisions when there's not a lot of data. Excelling at building caring, trusting, caring, trusting, positive emotional relationships with other human beings. Human emotions, positive emotional relationships with other people is going to be something that is, is going to be the best pathway to work. All right. And then excelling in doing trade jobs that require human dexterity and iterative diagnosis of the problem. So lots of physical movement and diagnosing the problem, and then an iterative trial and error approach to solving the problem. It's gonna be hard in the beginning for robots to do all of this moving around, all right? And going, you know, under the, in the, in the basement and under the basement and here and there and hanging off here. And so 
certain trade jobs will, will be there. And, but the biggest issue is, is that no matter who you are, how good you are, how many degrees you got, everybody is going to have to learn how to become a highly adaptive learner and learn, unlearn, and relearn at the pace of technological change. We are not wired to be good learners. Okay? We are not wired. Okay? We go out in the world the way our brains have been built. All right. We all like things to basically, you know, we know how to do them. Let's keep doing it this way. And we just keep going and going and going. Our brains are wired, okay, to we go out there and we seek confirmation of what we believe. Okay. We don't look to explore, we see confirmation. We also go out there making sure we affirm our ego, our story about who we are. And we want our story to be the same. Well, there's going to be a new story every two or three years. And think about it emotionally, how hard it is to basically change. And, you know, you get pounded and you're learning something. Oh, all of a sudden, that's no longer any good. You've got to work on this and learn this anew. That's very hard. And that requires us to basically take ownership of what's going on, all right, in our body. Ownership of our ego, our mind, our emotions, how we listen, how we relate to others. And think about it, okay? How many people have been trained to do that? How many people know how to manage their mind? All right? How many people know how to, if you will, quiet their ego so that they have a more open mind instead of a uh, mind trying to make sure that my mind's right? So it's a, it's a whole new ball game that's coming. And we, in organizations of every type, our political system has got to adapt ourselves where we can rewire ourselves and learn these new ways of being and working. And, and I, 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 understand, I understand what you're saying, but I'm thinking of the, the, the typical citizen, the typical worker who's just trying to put food on the table. These concepts yeah. are in a way foreign to a lot of people because they're just concerned about earning enough money to feed their families and to have a place to live. And you're talking about being adaptive and having meaningful work. And some people are not really even concerned about meaningful work. They just want work so they can feed their families. How do you make that? How do you bridge that? Well, you make a very good point and you're correct. You bridge that by somehow the people have to realize that, you know, I need to learn new skills. Where do I go learn those skills? How do I learn those skills, All right? Two, the companies they're, they're working with, hopefully will uh, uh, say, look, this, this job is gonna be done by technology. We'll give you the training, all right, to do a different job. If, if you want to do this different job, you're gonna to have to be very good at it and understand you're gonna probably have a different job every two to three years, all right? So no matter what, people are gonna to have to go and learn the skills, all right? Then the skills are, they're not necessarily hard, but they take real work, all right? And it's not something that you learn quickly, all right? It's so you're learning skills for this, like this highly adaptive, you're, you're, you're learning skills that allow you to be open-minded, to not be defensive, to defend what you think, but to explore and see what needs to be done. Um, but, but Ed, do you see this starting even in, in elementary school and uh, starting early with, with kids so they understand that the pace, I, I alluded to it in the beginning, that the pace of technology is accelerating all the time. And as you said, you're going to have to learn something new every couple of years, as opposed to the the old days, I use that in quotes, where maybe it was 10 years before you had to learn a new technology or five years. Now it's shortening even more. So do you think that it makes sense for school systems around the country and around the world to let students know to be prepared for these changes? 
school systems have to adapt and their mission will have to be creating highly adaptive learners, all right? The public schools, private schools, everybody, all right, is gonna be impacted by this. And so if you're asking me, should are our school systems doing this? Uh, some of the private schools are, um, many of the public schools are not. Um, you know, I have a piece coming out that basically says the, you know, uh, how public schools determine this will determine our democracy. All right, so absolutely. And uh, the, the, how students are taught is going to change. Not going to be 30 people in a classroom, all right, and everybody listening to the same stuff and everybody doing the same stuff. People are going to be trained in small teams. Small teams is the best way to do this. So, yes, and the challenge we have as a country is, is that in, in Europe, and in some other places in the world, the school systems are ahead of us on this. And they've been ahead of us for years. And so, yes, nobody's going to be, uh, there is no easy answer uh, to this. It's going to take transformation, probably the largest transformation, um, you know, in effect since the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it's going to be probably the most difficult time in our society since the Great Depression. And the United States government needs to take the lead, state governments need to take the lead, and we need to basically focus on what's really going to hit us and is hitting us and try to, we won't get ahead of it because technology is, is improving so fast. I mean, three of the best AI people in the world have been the last six weeks said that there will be by 2030 AI will be to be able to think in any way that a human thinks. All right. They used to say it's 20 years out or 30 years out. Then they came and said it was 15 years and they said it was 10. Now they're saying it's by 2030. Uh, so this is technology is moving faster than school systems and human beings. So what is it? Mean? But it's actually, but Ed, isn't it the humans that are making the technology move fast? It's not technology itself yes. moving fast. That's right. That's right. It's human, human beings are on, on, on the, you know, I built the technology and own it. You're right. exactly right. And, and, you know, and there were, um, you know, there were 10,000 technology leaders who signed a, a document earlier, probably mid last year saying we need to take a six month sabbatical and, and figure out how we're gonna do this work. And, you know, nobody was willing to take the sabbatical. So it's still racing ahead. And it's, it's, it's probably the most challenging thing, you know, since the atom bomb. And I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be, you know, overly, frightening people, but it is what it is. We, you know, everybody has got to sit back and our government has to take the lead. Uh, and that's all the way through from the top to, to local government. Uh, schools are going to have to change. Um, and that's every school will change somewhat and some more than others. So that, okay, how are we basically preparing our, our workforce? And okay, our workforce is going to shrink. What are we going to do with those people? And, and how are we going to make sure that they have a, you know, a meaningful life, so to speak, and meaning can just be having work. All right. Okay. For me, most people who go to work and do their job well, find it meaningful. All right. That's been my experience. Uh, so it's not that it's being, you know, really gushy. Uh, and so this is a major, major issue, which we don't have a handle on. I want to mention your book again, Own Your Work Journey, The Path to Meaningful Work and Happiness in the Age of Smart Technology and Radical Change, which is a long title. So I have not committed that to memory yet, but I will try to. But you mentioned earlier the Industrial Revolution, and then we had, of course, the 
the technological revolution. What would you call this particular revolution? Is it just an extension of the technology that we've already been exposed to in the last 30, 40 years? I, I would call it the AI revolution, artificial intelligence revolution. Are there scenarios that you see in your, from your research and your knowledge and your experience, do you see technology, I hate to bring it up, but somebody has to, uh, do you see it as a danger to mankind or humans in any way? I use mankind and people will say you should say humankind, but I'll just say humans. How do you, and are there, yes. is it a challenge to humans? Absolutely. Technology can be used for you know, uh, negative purposes. I mean, look look what happened in social media, right? What's happened in social media and look at the numbers from the uh, United States government on the number of teenage children that have basically killed themselves because of social media um, you know, hacking their emotions, right? So... We know technology can be dangerous, um, and we know that this technology will only add on to that because now we'll be hacking how people think, all right? I mean, there's lots of people that are talking about, they're very concerned about the upcoming presidential election because what AI, the power of AI, which is, say, come about in the last year, year and a half, the power of AI now is only going to accelerate more, um, you know, if you will, what's being said and who, where's it going to, it's going to be manipulating people, all right, and about uh, who to elect, et cetera. And so, no, it's, it's, it is a, there's, the history is there that it can, it, it can basically be, uh, and, and it can, it can basically be very bad. But the issue is there's no, so far in the world, there's been no way to how to basically keep it under control. All right, to keep it under control. In your book, you're talking about owning your own work journey, but is work going to really be an element in the future? In that if you have technology, you have robots, as I mentioned earlier, and you have AI, how much work needs to be done still for humans to live, survive, thrive, et cetera? Well, I'm assuming that there will be work. Otherwise, people will not earn money. Uh, and because in the United States, you know, we don't have a big social safety net, which says that if you get put out of a job for AI, um, you know, you will receive this amount of money for the rest of you know your life all right that's not come about so i'm a, i'm assuming uh, i mean that will have to be if you will breached it's or not breached but it basically what what's what's going to happen here is going to be so different than anybody has ever experienced and so different than what we experienced and so different than our culture, our work culture in the United States is survival of the fittest, right? Uh, there's many countries in the world which have a very different culture, which is people pay uh, more taxes than they pay here. So everybody in the country, including the people that are paying the taxes, have security, okay? They will have food, room and board, their homes, medical, whatever. And, you know, money is what, you know, is the primary driver of decisions in, in, in our country. That's just reality. And that's going to create tremendous challenges. And so far, there are people who are, who are working, trying to figure this out. But the race is so fast, all right. Nobody's getting a nobody's getting ahead, all right. And it says a lot when basically the technology just kept on going, even though we 
those 10,000 technologists who said six months sabbatical, please let's stop, let's stop this and figure out how we're, how we're going to manage this. And it's, um, it's, it's geopolitical. It's, um, it's, it's political inside the United States because there's big technology companies that are competing with each other to be the leader. And so, you know, you just got this thing is going and going and going faster and faster and faster. And, uh, there is work in Congress that people are talking about, but you know, how long is it going to take before we can get real answers as to how are we going to basically as a country take care of our people in a fair manner in light of the technology and what are we going to require the technology companies to do about this? Are we going to basically you know, increase the taxes on technology companies so we can pay and help the people who, you know, are not going to work for quite a while or ever. I mean, there's a whole big question here. And if you think about it in our system, you know, these are, these are questions which would transform our system. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't want our system transformed. When you decided to write the book, how did you set up your research so that you could, in essence, again, own your work journey, the path to meaningful work and happiness in the age of smart technology and radical change. Did you have a premise that you started with or did you research and then were surprised at the findings of your research or was it both? Um, well, the most of the research that I, that, that I did that part of which was new was on the technology. Um, the concept of work and transformation of work. I've been working in that space for, if you will, I've always sort of been an outlier and on the leading edge. And so I've been, I've been working on issues like this in the business world for, you know, well over 15 years. All right. I mean, closer to 20 years. And, you know, I have, four or five books that uh, that I started back in that, in fact, it's more than that. You know, I have 14 books I've written over the 20 years, all of which are building blocks to what is going on, all right? And so I know I did not start from scratch. Uh, what I've done with this book, what's different about this book, it's written for anybody with, you know, a high school education or even anybody 15 years or older, all right? And so most of my books have been written for uh, people who are educated or for organizations. And so I had most of the principles about what's, how do we train people? What's the journey to best self? What's it mean to take ownership of your ego, your mind, your emotions, uh, your behaviors? How do you need, how do you train somebody to be a good critical thinker, which is a good skill that's going to be needed? Well, all of that is, you know, I built over the years. And what I did with this book is, is it's a short book, about 127 pages, but it's got 28 tools and practices and 35 workshops. I wrote this book for um, people that, you know, don't have MBAs, people that uh, are not executives or, or senior people in businesses etc but writing it and putting it in a format uh, with tools for them to use these are the tools if you want to quiet your ego why should you quiet your ego because your ego gets in the way of learning and you're going to have to learn something new every couple of years and etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's all i mean the the sole purpose for the, for the book was to try to put something out there that will be helpful to the people who have the highest chance of being left behind. What was the most surprising thing you found in writing the book? Um, the most surprising thing was how fast the technology was moving and how open the key technology people were to saying that it could be real problematic and trouble and then the fact that 
we have been so slow in moving um, through our society and getting conversations like we're having going um, and that uh, people are sort of overwhelmed, they're scared, but the, and the leaders, I guess my biggest surprise has been uh, talking with leaders who, and th those are usually older people, talking with leaders and uh, having them say, uh, you know, not my job. Uh, you know, I've got these many years left and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing instead of embracing and saying, how do we make the changes? That was the most surprising thing, uh, disappointing thing. Um, not that they're evil people or mean people, but they don't know how to be an, how to be a highly adaptive learner. All right. Well, don't you think that, that isn't that just human nature at this point, whether they're a leader or not? I mean, that's the way we are. Yeah. yeah. That's the way we are. And that's in you, you just hit it. That is the, that's probably the best sentence that's been said in, in our talk. <laughs> that's the way we are. And the book is designed to teach you to overcome the way we are so you can learn, unlearn, and relearn at the pace of technological change. Good point. So it's science based. What's in the book has been proven in science. Here is the way to learn, unlearn, and relearn so you can stay ahead, so you can have a chance. No guarantees. So you have a chance. You're right. And, and that's why in our system, it's so, if you will, systems only change if people change. People only change if the, in, if you will, depending on whether it's schools or work, if the leadership in the money comes that it, you can do the change. And we I, haven't put all that together yet. Last question before I let you go. Most important question. Are you, after you've written this book, are you optimistic or pessimistic? I'm not a pessimist. Uh, but I'm very concerned. I'm not, a, I'm, I mean, I have, I have, I have some realistic hope because there are very bright people uh, who I know that are doing their best to create the start of what we've been talking about. Um, so I'm not, not i wish it would go faster all right uh i wish that there would be more pressure um uh, in in our political situation about this uh because there is i mean the european union is you know is probably the only democratic um part of the world that's created their story of how they're going to, if you will, transform themselves. I mean, and we, we have a story that's being talked about in group of Congress people, but, you know, it's, you know, European Union is ahead of us. Um, we need to basically accelerate this and it's going to be hard to accelerate this, uh, I guess, while there's an election going on. So that means we could lose, you know, a year, you know, another year or so. Well, 19, 2030 is coming pretty fast, right? The 2024, you know, and so even if we got something done in a year, 2025, how long does it take to get it in the school system? How long does it take to get it into the social s system? Um, so we've, we've got yeoman's work to do. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just doing a little part trying to help move this along. Well, that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been Edward D. Hess, Professor Emeritus of Business Administration at the Darden School of Business. And he's the author of Own Your Own Work Journey, The Path to Meaningful Work and Happiness in the Age of Smart Technology and Radical Change, available on Amazon and all the usual places. For everything yeah. about Ed, go to ownyourworkjourney.com and you can follow him on LinkedIn, YouTube, and X. And Ed, thanks for being on the show.
Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the very good questions and thank you for your concerns. Appreciate it. And join us every Thursday for a new schmear on Ira's Everything Bagel.